please. Here, here at the Lake Convention Center. Um, this is one of my favorite subjects, right? Disruptive innovation. And uh, what I will try to do today with you guys is uh, two things. I will establish how, due to all the technological advancements that we have available today, right, every single industry, every single company is up for being disrupted. Number one. Number two, I will try to provoke all of you to think about the things that you could be changing in your businesses or in your own jobs, right? Number one, to protect yourselves from being disrupted. And number two, to potentially prepare to becoming a disruptor in your industry or in another industry and, and taking advantage of this great opportunity that technology has brought to us. It has equalized the, the, the playing field between the big companies and the small. Since we haven't met before, uh, it's a valid question to ask who's this guy. So I'll take a couple minutes only to briefly share my background with you. This works, it does. So I am currently the global leader for uh, go-to-market strategy and sales execution for the IBM cloud, specifically the public cloud uh, within IBM Corporation. Aside from working for IBM, I have multiple hobbies. Uh, I have become a technologist over the years. I am a world traveler, I'm a speaker. Uh, I am also a skateboarder, a hobby that I've kept since I was a teenager, so you may see me uh, skating around, you know, Venice Beach once in a while uh, when I'm not giving conferences or, or working for, for IBM. Um, as far as my uh, you know, background, I have a degree in communications, an MBA in international management. Uh, since I got the MBA, I haven't stopped studying really. Some of the highlights, I got the opportunity to study um, cloud computing at Harvard University at the School of uh, Applied Science and Engineering. Uh, this is about 10 years ago when cloud computing was starting to be something more recently, I got the opportunity also to study artificial intelligence and neural networks at Stanford University. Uh, I'm currently studying a, a certification in strategy and management with McKinsey. So I'm really a, a current, a, a, a never-ending uh, student of the game, if you will. As far as my professional background, uh, I've had the opportunity to work for some of the leading innovators in the industry. I worked a few years for Microsoft, for Oracle, Salesforce. I've been with IBM since 2015. A uh, fun fact, before getting into technology, I was a, a TV host back in Mexico City, uh, my home country in Mexico. Uh, my second fun fact is that I've lived in all of these uh, cool cities. I currently live here in LA, where I'm having a really great time. Third and last fun fact, uh, anyone knows what a polyglot is? So I'm a polyglot, I'm fluent in all of these languages, if anyone wants to try me later. Uh, so that's uh, maybe a little bit just breaking the ice here. I'll uh, share with you a little bit of kind of who I am and where I'm coming from. Now with that quick disclaimer, today I am here on behalf of myself. I'm not as a formal speaker or a spokesperson of IBM. So pretty much what that means, if I say something that doesn't make sense, it's my fault, not IBM's, all right? <laughs> um, so, so with that, let's jump into our subject, innovation. Beautiful word, everybody talks about innovation, especially here in our industry, right, in technology. Everybody wants to be an innovator. And so many people don't really know what that means. So let's start from the beginning. Innovation is nothing new. It's been there for, for many, many, many years. And uh, it comes from the Latin word innovatum or innovare. And what it means is to renew or to change something that already exists. Different from inventing, which is creating something brand new from scratch. So innovating is improving something. And again, let's keep it you know, actively engaged. We don't have a lot of time for you know, exchange due to the limited agenda here. But think about it. Why would any one of you want to change something that already exists? There are many reasons, right? But me oversimplifying it, I can say that it comes down to two things. Number one is purpose. You see something and you strongly believe that the world could be better if you dedicate your time, energy, and money. Some people dedicate their entire life to innovate something, right? So purpose is one reason, money is another reason, right? And in the context of business, uh, corporations ideally should want to be motivated by both, by purpose and ambition. And some do, but again, for practical purposes, we know that companies need to make money to remain in business. So that's why companies innovate, to make money. Very simple, right? Making sense so far? Um, so, um, well, that's the why, right? Why would you do it? 
so let's, let's see how this works. This is what has become known as the S curve of innovation, right? And what we're seeing there is how over time, you know, usually companies start here, they come up with an idea, it takes them a little time to, you know, to figure out the market, eventually they figure out their strategy, they start to make some money, right? And as you go up on that S curve, is, you know, the company growing, right? Making more money, they hire some people, they keep growing, potentially go public, keep making money, but eventually they get to, they find themselves here, where growth gets flat, they stop growing. It happens to every company. So what do you do? when you are there. Uh, this is what is known as the innovator's dilemma, which by the way, there is a book by uh, Clayton Christensen, The Innovator's Dilemma. Not your typical book, is officially considered one of the six most influential books in the history of business uh, books. And what this does is it explains that dilemma that companies face, because let me tell you what most companies do. They do what they know how to do. What took them from zero to something, right, from here to here, so they do a little incremental improvement. They improve the packaging, they add a little extra functionality, they make the battery last a little longer, they make a little improvement. That's innovation, to some extent. But it doesn't take them too far. So what do they do? They make another one and another one. That's what they keep going. But that's not very sustainable. And the reason is because here, there's someone else solving the problem they are solving for their clients in a very different way. So if you continue doing this, you miss out on the opportunity. What companies should do, right, is, and this is the innovator's dilemma, is go through the pain of not making money and investing a lot of money to come up with a different <coughs> S-score, go back here to this. This is a falling revenue, right? So companies are trying to make the money for the next quarter and the next quarter and the next quarter. So they, don't, they make the mistake of not doing this. If they do, they take the next score that is gonna take them all the way up here. And then, a few years later, when they get flat, they need to do the same, and the same, and the same. And that's the only way you remain in business for the long run. So I want you to, to, to read this for a second and process this for a moment, all right? These are official numbers. So over the past 10 years, more than 50% of the Fortune 500 companies have pretty much gone out of business or gone bankrupt or are wiped out or were acquired by someone else. Think about it, these are the largest, most successful, most powerful companies in the world. Matter of 10 years, 50% of them are gone. And this is happening across all industries, retail, transportation, you name it, all right? And why is this happening? Well, because of all of these guys here, what has come up to, uh, become to be known as the Uber effect, where you have the largest transportation company in the world that doesn't own any car, right? And by the way, I had the opportunity to meet the Harvard Business School professor who wrote the case on Avis acquiring a Zipcar. So we had the opportunity to talk, right? These guys didn't just disrupt the taxi industry, they disrupted also the car rental industry, like Avis, right? Because now business travelers like me, I don't want to rent a car, I don't want to park, I don't want to go, you just get Uber. So that affected them. But it also affected the car manufacturers in large city centers. Many people don't need to buy a car or don't need to buy the second car right, they use Uber. It actually affected the uh, ambulance services. There is a study that shows that now more than 50% of people who get to an emergency room do it in an Uber. <laughs> it's much cheaper, in some cases faster, than calling an ambulance. So it disrupted many industries, right? They are valued above General Motors. Um, and then you have, you know, Airbnb, one of the largest accommodation companies in the world, and they don't own any real estate. They are valued above Hilton hotels today. They are worth more money than Hilton. They don't own a single property. They are uh, almost as valuable as uh, Marriott Hotel, which is the largest group in the world. And Marriott is trying to hit them back. Now they are having Marriott properties where you can rent a villa. But Marriott is buying the villa. So it's very difficult for them to compete with these guys. Uh, and then you have, again, Amazon, largest uh, retailer, doesn't own any inventory, and so on and on and on and on. I went a little further in my research and said, okay, let's go back to the original Fortune 500 list. So when you go back to 1955, which is not a lot of time, it's 60 years, 64 years, right? Just 60 years ago, right? You come and you look which companies from that original list are still in business, only 50 of them have survived for 60 years. Only 50 of them are there. IBM is one of them, by the way. And that's because IBM has been able to transform itself, to use those cores of innovation. We're not selling, you know, typing or punching machines anymore. We're selling quantum computing and blockchain. It has changed. And that's the only way to remain in business. 
Um, so who's next? Right? Can anyone here can tell me tell me of an, any industry that you think is not at risk of being disrupted? Any industry. What about your company? What about your job, your specific job function? Jobs are being disrupted through technology, right? What about you? Right? Are you safe from disruption? So, so again, the, the, the provocation here is think about how you at the personal level can continue learning the new skills that are necessary to be valid and relevant in the marketplace, to continue studying nonstop, right? Back to my second slide. And uh, as far as a business, to continue innovating. So let's uh, look at a um, little uh, self-assessment here, if you will, on some of the you know, qualities of companies that are innovators and think on what you're doing in your business, regardless of your role, regardless of whether you are the, the CEO of a company or a strategy manager or a business analyst, it doesn't matter. Think about how your business is operating and what you guys should do to, uh, to, to be an innovator, right? So again, usually I would want to make this more interactive. Unfortunately, I have to kind of keep running to cover the content. But uh, so innovators are actively experimenting, right? New ways to serve their clients, looking for ways of doing things a little different, a little better, all the time. Uh, culture is fundamental for innovation, right? Many people say, yeah, well, we're innovators. But when someone makes a mistake, they fire them. That discourages innovation because innovation requires experimentation and failure. Failure is required for success. And so companies that fire you for, for, for making a mistake, they are not encouraging innovation. A culture of innovation is a culture that allows people to take risks. Um, digital transformation, right? This is taking advantage of a modern set of IT and, and the technologies that enable the business to be agile and, and take advantage again of all the opportunities that are there to move fast. Because they, they, the game of innovation is not size, as it was many generations uh, a few years ago, it's now speed. The, the company that is faster to, to, to move are the companies who are able to remain in business. Sorry, uh, innovators are actively experimenting with emerging technologies. They don't wait until the technology is proven. They are experimenting how they can incorporate those benefits to their business model while they are still experimental. Then a very simple metric, right, is research and development. That's very simple. Whatever the industry that you are in, just go on Google, what is the average research and development investment for my industry, and then see how much you're doing in your company. And if you are investing average, well, you're average, right? You need to invest above average in, in research and development to, to remain in business. Sorry, I'll uh, sit here. And then, perhaps the more important question is not, not only innovating, it's level is disruption, right? And so, companies that are disruptors are not only trying to improve what they do, are exploring how they can replace what they do. How they could replace their entire business. Because if you don't do it, someone else will do it. Someone else will replace you. So you might as well find a way to replace your model yourself and remain in business with a different model. Does that make sense? All right? Cool. Um, I, and another very important characteristic is disruptors are actively innovating. They have something like an innovation lab or whatever you want to call it, right? A research center or something. They are looking for ways in working on projects that are outside their core business. A great, I could talk about IBM, we do it as well, but maybe a very good, well-known example is Google, right? They started doing search, online search, and then they went into productivity applications competing with Microsoft, and they did well. And then cloud computing, and then they acquired you know, YouTube, and they've done a series of things. Today, they are investing on self-driving vehicles. Any connection between online search and self-driving vehicles, completely outside their core business. That's, that's what disruptors do. They, they have a more broad vision of things. And then something very important is disruptors understand the real need of their clients. And, and, and this, is a, this, is, this is a very important point that I, I will explain with a, with, a, with a real life example of a company that was doing great, but they missed what was the real problem that they were solving. Does anyone remember Tower Records here, right? Uh, for any millennials here in the room that didn't get to know about our records, right? Uh, they were very, very popular, and they were here from LA, right? And it became a global retail chain all over the world. I was just in, you know, Japan. They had a store there. I mean, everywhere, right? All over the world. So, 
these guys were very successful and they owned the music market. Why did they go out of business? Did they do something wrong? They didn't do anything necessarily wrong and that's what Clayton Christensen explains in The Innovator's Dilemma. Even if you don't do anything wrong, they didn't realize that there were changes happening, right? The industry went from one place to tapes that you could take now on your Walkman, to um, you know, CDs, to micro CDs, to uh, then MP3 files, then the Napster came in and turned out to be illegal, so then Apple took advantage and they create, cre created uh, iTunes, and then Pandora and Spotify came up, and by when they realized that they were out, and so what they did is those little incremental improvements. Oh, can we bring more bands to the, to the stores to sign autographs? Can we reduce the prices? Can we make it more appealing? Can we put something, some flowers at the entrance so people want to come? They didn't realize that people really, right, and this is the point of the real business, they thought that their business was selling long plays, and they were very good at it. They were the best in the world at it, right? That was not their business. What was their business? This is a critical question. That's the answer. They were bringing music to people. And the long play doesn't, I don't care. Would you care to have a long play right now? No. You care to listen to the music, unless you are a collector or something, but you care about the music. Their business was bringing music to people. And they missed that very clear need of what they were supposed to do. They could have done many things. They could have created their own online platform. They had the money to do it, to deliver MP3 files online, towerrecords.com. They didn't, what did they do on towerrecords.com? They sold long plays and CDs. They missed the opportunity. And they were taken out of business for that reason. And that led to this, you know, uh, in Sunset Boulevard, right? Uh, end of the world as we know it, thank you for your lo loyalty. Went out of business. Now, this happens to many other companies. Remember Blockbuster, this is another, I also met the professor who wrote this case for Harvard Business School. Another fantastic story, could take an hour to talk about it, right? Out of business, Radio Shack, Kodak, um, what is this, Sears, a very powerful retailer, right? They, they were an icon of American power, the Sears Tower in Chicago, right? They already lost the name, now it's Willis Tower. Uh, Nokia, very powerful. All of them were wiped out by these guys who took opportunity. And what do all of these guys have in common? By the way, there are many more, right? And we could fill you know, the slide with hundreds of them. What all of these guys have in common is that they created platforms. They created platforms to integrate an ecosystem to take it to their advantage. Um, there is, there is a, a, um, a concept of uh, business model innovation, right? And it talks about value creation and value capture. Value creation is what you do, you add some value to the, to, the, to the chain of what you are offering, right? And that costs money and time and energy and research and so on, in light of being able to then do some value capture, make some money, make a profit, right? And that's a game. Creating a platform allows companies to do the value capture of the, 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 the fun part of the game, of business, which is making money, right? By collecting data, Leveraging algorithms, which together help to improve the client experience as the CX, the customer experience, which in turn will increase usage, which in turn will increase the amount of data that they have and it creates a positive cycle. That's what platforms do. They create this ecosystem and that's why all these companies that are platform-based companies are so successful. Um, so quickly, I'll share with you some of the characteristics of disruptive innovation, right? Um, number one, they create an entirely new paradigm of doing things. A good example, there could be many others, right? It's software as a service. You all may have heard of Salesforce.com, right? They, so within the technology industry, they disrupted all of the software companies delivering the same, same like with the book, with the, the long plays, right? delivering the music in a different way. These guys delivered the software in a different way. They disrupted the industry, big time. Uh, disruptive innovation provides benefits to the end users by a revolution, not by an evolution. It's not a progressive, incremental advancement. It comes up with something completely different. Think about manufacturing, right? 
Since the times of uh, Henry Ford, over 100 years ago, uh, with the assembly line, which was a great revolutionary innovation in manufacturing, there have been so many systems like Total Quality Management, Kaizen, Six Sigma, which all of them help create little incremental improvements. Very good, very good. But these minor improvements, can we tweak here? Can we save a second here? Can we save a penny there? That's what it does. What 3D printing does is it gets rid of the entire assembly line of the entire manufacturing plant altogether. <laughs> Think about that. So it disrupts a series of different industries. Um, this disruptive innovation also redefines a business model, right? The old paradigm, the old way of doing things becomes useless. And again, back to Blockbuster versus Netflix, right? Netflix rendered, Blockbuster didn't do anything wrong necessarily. They just became irrelevant because everybody prefers to just, from your living room, get your movies, right? Um, Another characteristic of this is the strength on the old business model becomes not only useless, but it actually becomes a weakness on the new business model. The example of Uber, think about years before, you own a fleet of trucks, you own a thousand trucks. Well, guess what? Precisely because you own a thousand trucks, it's impossible that you will compete with these guys because you have all of that sunk cost there. You need to do all the maintenance, it, the assets are depreciating, it becomes a pain. These guys don't have to deal with all of that. So your strength on the previous model now becomes your weakness. Very difficult to compete with a disruptor. Um, and then very important, they are, disruptors are solution oriented. Um, from our example from Tower Records, which I think is very relevant, think about uh, books as well, right? Companies like Audible. Right, where you can listen to an audio book. I'm a big reader, I read about the book per week. I do it through these guys. Now, people say, you're not reading. Well, it depends. What do you call reading? I mean, do I have the piece of paper here? No, but I get the knowledge. I walk out of my you know, four hour flight and I already know the content of what the guy said. Yeah, I read the book. We can talk about it, right? So these guys focus on what the ultimate end user wants. I want to know what the writer said and I do through an audio book. So these are disruptive characteristics, right? Um, some of the disruptive technologies, and again, I could spend you know, an hour talking about each of these ones, right? Cloud computing, disruptive technology, it became the new standard, or did it? Because now cloud computing has been disrupted, and I'll tell you with the last point, right? Um, artificial intelligence is a completely disruptive technology, technology it, and all the different variations of you know, machine learning and deep learning and, and so on. All of the what is encompasses artificial intelligence, it allows companies to really more deeply understand and actually predict what their consumers want, right? And so it is extremely, extremely uh, disruptive technology and it opens multiple possibilities. Quantum computing, I was talking with someone here earlier, right? Um, it, you know, IBM has the, the only publicly available quantum computer on the cloud, you can go and start using it today, right? So quantum computing leverages, you know, the concepts of quantum physics, right? Which is this principle of superposition to make amazingly big calculations that can help for ultra-efficient logistics, for understanding the size of the universe, for making financial predictions and prevent financial crisis. This is a big, big, big deal, right? And it, it, it can be applied in multiple industries. And then there is you know, a series of technologies, a series of disruptive technologies. And the thing is that technology builds on itself. Technologies leverage each other, and then they, they create this you know, network that you can leverage to do things that were unthinkable just 20 or 10 years ago, five years ago to that matter, right? Again, the self-driving cars and, and you know, robotics, nanotechnology, there are so many technologies available. Blockchain, we're on the blockchain track here, and um, I've given talks about blockchain, right? Uh, we're doing some very interesting things at, at IBM with blockchain, uh, like for Food Trust, for example. We created a, a global consortium that started with Walmart, and now we brought Nestle and all of the you know, food manufacturers and the distributors and so on, so you can track and you know exactly where your food comes from, if it is really organic, as they say, and so on, and many more benefits, right? So transparency in food is one. You know, we're tracking diamonds, we're working with Maersk, Maersk 
the largest uh, uh, international trade company in the world, the guys with the containers, reducing all the inefficiencies that came from multiple paperwork, right? It, you know, actually about 50% of what you pay for the goods that you buy that are transported internationally is due to the administrative paperwork of moving it from one port to another. It's not the price of the actual value of the thing that you have in your hand. This thing, whatever I paid for it, 50% was administrative cost. So with blockchain, we're helping improve that, for example. And there are many, many use cases, right? Then I told you, cloud got disrupted. Now there is this new thing called containerization of cloud, right? Through microservices and uh, Kubernetes. And this is a new way that creates multiple possibilities for companies, right? To migrate their applications from one place to another, to develop in a much more agile fashion and so on. And that, what that means is speeding, right? Accelerating the speed of innovation. You have an idea and you can have it up to the market in a matter of two or three days, not in a matter of two or three months, right? Or years as it used to be. Remember with Office? It was Office 2007, then the new version would come until 2010, then 2013. Now the new versions, you get them on your apps on your phone every, you know, every other day. And that's thanks to these new technologies, right? So we have all of these amazing technologies. The point is that you don't need to be a massive global corporation to take advantage of them because two or three guys, you know, here, normal people like us with not much money can go and buy as a service, right? Get the skills of the cloud and let one of these mega guys, whatever you want, Microsoft or IBM or Google or Amazon, you know, have all the skill that you need in case you grow. But in case you don't grow, you didn't pay for all of the infrastructure. So that's amazing, right? Um, I would love to go, you know, a little deeper on all of this. Um, but there are, yeah, all of this creates a network of possibilities, right, for disrupting industries, for innovating um, within the means of any normal person. You don't need to have billions of dollars to do it. You just need to have the vision and the drive. So some, you know, quick takeaways here from this, right? Number one, embrace digital transformation, right? And that's having an aligned strategy between the technology strategy, business strategy, leveraging that modernization for your business so that you can take advantage of the speed of this. Think about what you would need to do to replace your business and start working on that because someone else is doing it. So you might as well do it yourself. Someone else is doing it. Whether you're doing consulting services or have some physical product or whatever you do, someone else is trying to solve that need for your clients better than you. And think about it that way. Don't think incremental. Think disruptive. Is there a much better, simple way for my client to solve the problem that doesn't need what I offer? That's what you need to think. That's disruptive thinking. And then trying to be a little funny here, and if we thought of uh, our good friend uh, um, Shakespeare, right? Um, in times of artificial intelligence, he would have said to disrupt or to be disrupted. That is the new question in the new world of business. Those are some of the takeaways. There are multiple weeks, uh, books. As I said, I'm, I'm an avid reader. Certainly, I recommend that you read The Innovator's Dilemma. Right? Uh, Vaporized is a fantastic book. I had the opportunity to meet the author. Uh, he explains the whole uh, uh, this thing, um, Tower Records study in depth. Um, what else? All of these are great books, right? The Myths of Innovation, for sure. I also met this uh, Paul uh, Doherty, the, the CIO of, which is CIO, not, C in, not Chief Information, but this Chief Innovation Officer of Accenture. Human Plus Machine, really, really good book. All of this, I have posted my list of my 100 favorite books that I've read on my LinkedIn profile. So if someone wants to connect with me, uh, you know, just Pavel Ferreri, you can find me on LinkedIn and look up my posts. Um, so with that, my friends, stay thirsty. <laughs> if you are familiar with that campaign. All right. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you very much. Very interesting uh, presentation. So, uh,